Uh, hi everyone, and I'm Laura Jantunen. I'm a dance artist and also been involved in video for years. Yeah, hi, I'm Ilmari Kvanenen. Um, I'm still a student here, doing my, like, writing my MA thesis and uh, involved in uh, various kind of uh, f uh, fields in the video, from VJing to performances. Mm. And together we have this project uh, called ELE. Yeah, uh, ELE, which in English means a gesture. Uh, it's our research project about the videos, video images possibility to evoke kinesthetic empathy in the spectator. Yeah. Uh, this is the very first steps of our project. We have started it uh, this year and this lecture is also the first ever English presentation. So uh, some words might be there, kind of. Uh, we have uh, put our, given ourselves like three main uh, focus points for our research. Where the first one we want to extend and extend the knowledge about the development process of kinesthetic empathy, uh, and this we are very focused on finding how it works in video and especially in abstract video. Uh, this is where we are now in the first stage. Uh, in the future, we hope to develop concrete tools that we can share for other artists that they can detect and detect how kinesthetic empathy is happening in their bodies. Uh, and then we also hope to find uh, new meeting points between choreography and video. Uh, since we both have, I'm a like, dancer, choreographer and video maker and Ilmar is involved strongly in video, so we hope that when we brew in the same pot long enough, we will find like new meeting points. For example, how uh, video and performance could be more immersive or choreographical, all this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so next we briefly explain the kinesthetic empathy, first kinesthesia and then empathy, and after that show little example videos and which we can talk together also. And um, yeah, to understand and to go deeper into kinesthetic empathy, we are observing the kinesthesia and empathy like a first separately. Yeah. And we view kinesthesia from, uh, we have focused to view it from the phenomenological perspective and from the way it is used in dance. Yeah. And well, a little bit about the phenomenological perspective. Uh, Jaana Parviainen, a researcher from uh, Tampere University, says that uh, kinesthesia refers to functionality of human body and its ability to experience movement. And uh, next, uh, next I try to go briefly a little bit deeper. Uh, Edmund Husser, the founder of the phenomenological movement divides uh, body into the physical body and lived body. The physical body is the uh, organic, biologic and the physiologic me, kind of the atoms. Uh, and this physical body works regardless of my will. Uh, this lived body uh, is the part of the body who uh, feels and experiences a physical body. Uh, this lived body, uh, we are aware of the lived body, and uh, lived body is the one who perceives and is being perceived, and lived body detects and it's been detected, like I can touch and I, I, I'm being touched. Uh, and for example, my breath works like despite my will, like it's the uh, will of the physical body, but with the lived body I can control the pace of my breath or something like this. And so meaning the lived body is kind of the conscious part of me, kind of the subject me and the physical body more, is more object me. And 
we might refer to me if I say me or myself. That's the lived body of, of myself. Kind of. And Edmund Husserl thinks that kinesthesia comes. What is the next slide? Yeah, kinesthesia comes before senses. Uh, so uh, kind of everything needs, every sense needs movement for them to work. Like for example, my eyes, the lens of my eye works regardless of my will, but so it's part of the physical body. But my uh, lived body can focus and turn head, and also I can shut my eyes and be out of the, uh, this kind of visual world. And it's, the, like, it's this kinesthesia which connects my lived body and the physical body, because there is this movement happening all the time in my body. I can't be still, I can't stop moving. My liver is working, my heart is working, like I'm all the time involved in movement. Yeah, you can put the next one. Uh, in dance education, kinesthesia is used a lot to, for dancers to learn to access their physical body through their lived body. And it wants to kind of widen, widen the lived body in the dancer's physical body. This is, this is done through, for example, in release technique or in movement research practices where m many of the movements are learned by not by teachers showing how they're done, like it's done in ballet, you show the positions and the, then the students follow them. But more that the teacher tells like lift your arm and then the dancer is eyes closed and they have to somehow figure out how would they lift their arm. Uh, usually it can be also used in very like simple exercises, like how do you shift your weight? weight. So usually it's like you just do it, but when you actually observe how it's done, you notice that there's very many different muscle groups in action. So when dancer is like uh, keeps on exercising on their uh, lived body, they get very much more skill, and then they can easily access different techniques much more faster than in other techniques. The lights are very bright, so that's why I'm all the time like this. I think I said almost everything, or did I forget something? Nothing, yeah. Yeah, that's let's great. continue. Yeah. So next, uh, we go a little bit through what is empathy. Mm. Um, empathy is a relatively new word. It has come up only in the beginning of the 20th century. And before that, sympathy was used like in a similar way. But nowadays, like in this modern language, we di divide sympathy from empathy, but empathy needs also a sympathy. Uh, and uh, Polish uh, philosopher Edith Stein, who studied underneath Husser and later became his assistant, has divided like the process of empathy into three steps. And in the first step, uh, you notice the situation where empathy happens, like somebody's feeling sad and you immediately feel that in your body or in your system and you might feel a little bit sad yourself. This is involuntary stage. The second stage, you start to, you step into the other one's experience and you feel the other one's sadness in you. And this is voluntary step. And then the third one, uh, you step out from the experience of the other and realize you are your own person and you have your own feelings, but you are still like trying to understand why the other one is feeling sad. This is also voluntary uh, action. So the first one happens involuntarily and the second two you need to actually willingly do and imagine. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, and please ask if yeah. you want to ask anything or add yeah, or whatever. Yeah, if we're too fast or something. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, now the words together, kinesthetic empathy. Uh, Who was talking, was it me? Yes. You, you yeah, this talking. was kind of my task to do through. Uh, kinesthetic empathy, it requires a willing act to step into the other person's movement. Uh, 
and what they are doing. It doesn't happen by itself. So, yes, next one. And then when the more the movement is, resembles my own way of moving, like for me it's easier to step into a dancer's body that moves similarly to me than to a dancer's body who is like trained completely differently. Uh, but we are able to experience kinesthetic empathy towards any movement. For example, uh, if we see it like this, there's like in this end there's a human movement and then there's the dog movement, and then there's the plant movement. And we have nicely also a dog here, and then we have a plant here. So it's easy to explain <laughs> in like different ways. So for a human, it's really super easy to understand human motions. So when I move, you, are my, you activate your like, brain and you feel me moving. When a dog moves, you need to adjust a bit more to understand that, okay, they have paws, and they're a bit like our hands and legs, and okay, now they move like that, and now I somehow can access the kinesthetics of their like, little body. But when it gets slightly more difficult, it's like when we try to uh, access the kinesthetics of a plant. And then Edith Stein says that it is possible, but it's just quite tricky. And how we do it is through the, uh, observing the vitality of the plant. Like plant has, first it's like a seed, then it starts growing, and then it becomes a big tree, and then it dies. And then it's chopped into pieces, and somebody builds a house from it. So, for example, this one, we took it because it looked super sad. And here you can notice I also used the word sad, so I was putting some like um, motions towards the plants, which is kind of a human way to understand things, but it's like we realize like it hasn't maybe got enough water because I would probably look like this if I would be thirsty. So if we give it water, it might get better. And then we have had this slightly like empathetic feeling towards the plant. Of course, kinesthetics of a plant is slightly more trickier to achieve because it grows super slowly. So it's hard to see the movement of it but we know it has it because we see the different stages, for example, in a year when the field leaves fall and so on. Yeah, yeah same kind of a process that <coughs> we are growing and the plants are growing and we share vitality. So yeah. in that way we have access to this plant. Yeah, through, through this through juice, vitality. Of, juice of life, yeah. how could I say? Um, then, but, uh -huh. But there we could also, to the kinesthetic empathy, to the last one, add that it is also, even though now I mentioned like examples that are living, but w we believe that it's possible to experience kinesthetic empathy towards any movement, even mm. to the movement of the, like the paper, when it's doing like this, or yeah. falling or something. Yeah, uh, German researcher Thomas Fusch, maybe pronounced, um, divides this empathy process in three steps. Primary empathy, extended empathy and fictional empathy. Uh, this primary empathy is an intercorporeal act, uh, which is implicit and needs like a bodily component. Uh, it arises from like bodily uh, contact and it needs some it needs like this Laura's present presence to happen, and like when Laura smiles and I smile and this kind of a thing. <laughs> uh, but this and in extended empathy, uh, we, we, we Fush goes a little bit. He doesn't talk about Stein so much, but he goes a little bit uh, further in these Stein's three steps. That this uh, extended empathy is perspective taking. It's explicit. And it's a conscious act that I'm just thinking this other person, and or I'm uh, I'm feeling the other person, but I'm also asking why the other person is fe feeling this way, and I'm. It has the imaginative quality, so you, yeah. there's the imagining involved already there, which can be already seen a part of as virtual. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm imagining myself being in the same situation and I'm imagining me as if I were uh, the other and I'm putting myself to the other one's kind of sh shoes you could say. 
So this extended empathy needs this imaginary as if structure. I have to a little bit imagine. Mm. And uh, in the second stage, the other person doesn't need to be present. So it can happen through like a telephone call or something, right? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> uh, fictional empathy. Well, this is like a truly <laughs> fictional or imaginary, uh, which we can feel towards fictional persons or characters or even these non-personal agents, like whatever, class. Um, in this, we are not engaged in kind of bodily presence, but for example, in a film, we can um, we can feel the this actor's body, like the actor is actually given for me, uh, but the role the actor is playing is not actually given to me. So I'm gonna I have to imagine the this world, or I have to imagine <coughs> it, it's my imagination, the my suhde, um, my relationship to this role the uh, actor is playing. So in this sense, this fictional empathy is a little bit one-way thing. I'm feeling this fictional character, but the character cannot sense mm. me. But of course, there are some parts that if we go very further, we can interact with avatars or things like this. So there is some interaction or interaction, but yeah. Mm. And yeah, Fuss thinks that this is the kind of how virtuality increases, like fictional in towards the fictional empathy. In the primary empathy, we are uh, in the same space, in the bodily contact, and in the fictional empathy happens in the kind of in a virtual spaces or true virtual. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah. And should we say about the, how this fictional empathy like differences? How fictional empathy can be, it's like there's some good and bad qualities, but uh, like I can extend my empathy with this modern technology or digital technology. Mm. I can feel empathy towards somebody totally somewhere else, physic in another like a, uh, in another physical space and maybe another time or so. And uh, this, how, this, this way to kind of get them closer to me. Mm. But this closeness can be also like a little bit, uh, it's not bodily close, it's like kind of phantomized and it can be very easily broken. Mm. But yeah, at the same time, this this fictional empathy uh, brings me closer to the like uh, people I, I'm not seeing, mm -hmm. and but also this only primary empathy can kind of free myself from these imaginations. This fictional empathy needs to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we were thinking in this like having the example of like for example me. I have grown up in a farm where there's like four people I see every day and that's it. So my kind of the feel that I can feel empathy towards is very, in a way, narrow. Like the, they all look like me because my, they are my relatives. So in a way, when I move forward, uh, further, then uh, uh, suddenly there's like people who look super different. So then I have to kind of train my empathy to <laughs> a access more kinds of people. But then you can train it like I did by watching a lot of movies. So <laughs> then you see there are all these characters. So you tra train different kind of experience that you might not uh, experiencing in your own life. So when you encounter them, you might have some like empathy training happen that happened in like TV show or something. This is a very naive example, but at least I think I have learned a lot of empathetic skills from movies. Yeah. Even though it's like super one way in movies. And then, like, yeah, but just like that. Incorporeal. Yeah. yeah. Mm, yeah, in um, in our uh, research, we kind of uh, we have very <laughs> much more uh, how to say um, simple simple <laughs> division. Uh, 
we have divided these things to uh, direct experience and mediated experience. And our, we are researching this mediated experience of empathy, but with these uh, <laughs> kind of studies from direct experience because uh, it, it, it has much more liter literature and uh, it has much more research done from the, yeah. this direct bodily experience. Yeah. yeah uh, I think that's it. I can't imagine anything new. Yeah. So uh, now the second phase. <laughs> yeah. And actually the second phase starts with a small like, uh, uh, exercise where we go deeper into the, our body. Uh, so it's exercise we all do by ourselves and I will try do my best to direct it for you. So is there a possibility to get the lights a bit mm -hmm. down? Thank you. So let's first everybody close our eyes and uh, concentrate to our breathing. The process of breathing in and out. Notice how the air rolls in through your nose or your mouth to your throat and to your chest. Then take note how your chest during every in-breath, it rises up and during every out-breath it sinks back down. Notice how during every breath you take, actually your whole body is moving. And now imagine how your breath and the air goes all, to, all the way to your extremities. So you don't just take note on your chest or your torso, but spread the air towards your legs and hands. <coughs> And a few more breaths breath before opening your eyes.
Ça glisse, ça glisse We just randomly showed you four video clips without really saying anything before it. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, if somebody wants to comment or did you <laughs> felt them through your body or with your body or... Okay, yeah, go ahead, Carla. Uh, yeah, I felt like, especially in the, in the first video, Changing of colors and also the changing of the shapes, but especially the changing of the colors was like really. I, I sort of like felt the same way as as when I'm inhaling and exhaling. So mm. it's like mm. the black was exhaling and the and the colorful was inhaling for mm. me. So yeah, yeah, true. Mm -hmm. Really worked well. And I think the the exercise beforehand, like that, really concentrating on on my on my breathing, really helped me with, with coming up with that experience. So. Mm. Mm -hmm. history that I could prepare, but yeah. also the, the, because the car crashes were like, uh, they were concrete, I could, I could like, somehow relate to it. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. true. All this more. <laughs> yeah. Let's go this. Who was it? Oh, you can see. Because you talk about empathy, but I, I also like felt more empathy with the, with the balls in the first videos. I mean, the whatever digital balls they were. Yeah. Mm grouping and regrouping than with uh, Jason Bourne. There, but it also <laughs> has to do when you take a clip like that for them because movies works like that, that you tell the story so that you sort of get to know the character and then he gets into the car chase. Mm. But when you take just the car chase, of course, you are not, yep. you don't know who's in the car, you don't know who to follow, so you just mm. take this as an action scene. Yeah. But, uh, but we were talking about the direct empathy or this physical empathy. It also happens with like material objects, and you can really feel mm. yeah. feel for them. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. I don't know who was first. Maybe maybe you. Yeah. yeah um, it was interesting for me the first video when I realized <coughs> that I felt very much empathy for the balls. Yeah. But then I noticed that there is this environment, and it is like I can. Uh, myself into in this whole structure yeah. mm -hmm. and then this environment is like outside mm -hmm. of my empathy it's 
like yeah. uh, like the movement takes mm. all my empathy in, and then mm. these uh, steel structures are like they are they don't deserve <laughs> my empathy. And it was a strange notion, and then I tried to um, uh, analyze the same mechanics in the, the next videos. And in the second one, then uh, everything that was there was like I felt everything. And then in yeah. five, then also I put myself in the position of the human. Yeah. Mm. And then I, uh, in, the, all, in all of the videos, I made some kind of choice which part is deserving my empathy. Yeah. The part was, that was most resembling myself, like the movement, or the <coughs> walls are more like me than the mm. walls. Yeah, mm. yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I think that it's also related to the well, to the audio track mm. because the first first one was really the the the, the breathing and and the rhythm uh, not not only the rhythm of the of the audio because mm. of the third one was a <laughs> and this was full mm. action and it was so thi this was like a, I, I guess that there was a relationship with the with, with the, exactly. the info they had felt because it was the rhythm was the same. Mm. The first one. Yeah. I Very much so. Mm. Yeah. Sophia. Yeah, I had the, the same thing. I was just wondering how much the music affects the yeah. 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 For example, in the second mm. one, yeah. it could have been quite satisfying for me. But the yeah. music uh, somehow went to the Ungava. Yeah, threatening. Ah, uh, you have really mad. Uh, <coughs> I found that, um, that the gravity played quite a huge role, especially in the mm. first one, because uh, I felt like empathetic with the balls, but then I realized that they don't uh, follow the rules of gravity, so mm. it became quite scary. Mm. Yeah, go ahead, first. Um, yeah, I've heard two different things, but just shortly about uh, maybe the last bit, like, like there's like these active like editing decisions in it that like prevent you from maybe developing this empathy because the camera yeah. changes all the time and mm. it becomes much less clear, like... Like you have to in the scene in a way, or yeah. like background pictures were not like random in our slides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I think the notion of uh, somebody deserving my empathy is also interesting. <laughs> that we try to control our empathy. So yeah. <laughs> it's like a gift that we give to the world. <laughs> no, I give Mr. Ball, <laughs> you deserve my empathy. And mm -hmm. I try to control my empathy in the, because I'm afraid of heights. When the bike video came up, uh, I like heard mm. myself say, telling me, "I'm not part of this." I'm not. <laughs> I said, I told myself like literally in my in, inside myself, "I'm not watching this." <laughs> and I, I was watching it, but I was sort of tried to distance mm. myself mentally, physically, psychologically from the processes. I was just, "Oh, this is one of those YouTube clips <laughs> <laughs> with uh, somebody riding, somebody crazy, probably yeah. Russian guy." doing something crazy, but I'm not a part of this. Yeah. So we try to like yeah. control this. Yeah, it's and the imagining part you yeah. can kind of leave out if you decide yeah. to do it. He doesn't it. deserve my <laughs> <laughs> did, did you have Kimmo? Yeah. 
no, no, no. It's, it was about the editing. It yeah. was really hard to uh, go with the uh, the car video because it was edited. So the movement was edited out mm -hmm. in a way for yeah. maximum effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it truly needs a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those <coughs> kind of all those videos have these um, representative qualities. Like the first one has the space. It's digitally made, but it resembles like a physical space, so it's yeah. easy to like a, put yourself there. And the second one was this vacuum, so maybe everybody know, but it's like how it goes. It was like this uh, tune, what is it? pillow, yeah. pillow types of things and everything. So <clears throat> kind of representative, representative, and uh, and the third one was like <laughs> uh, documentation. Mm. So I, I, where I can put myself in the place, like I'm in the in the middle of the kind of the happening. So the, the technology mm. brings me to the very middle, and in the car chase, this technology, technology like editing and camera things, mm. they are made so that I could be in the center of the happening. Mm. Like if you compare to the car chases 50 years ago, or even more, they I'm were. Gonna, sorry. Yeah. They were like filmed <laughs> outside, but now 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 this uh, with new like a meta movements of the camera, like shaking or putting some shape there or here mm -hmm. and there, and uh, the makers of the mov mm -hmm. mo this movie or movies uh, like in total mm, try to get get the uh, uh, viewer to the center of the happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in the Born clip, the thing that it's showing us is like <coughs> a quality of movement, which is like speed. So we can't really be born, but we can feel the speed he is in. So this is somehow I think used a lot, especially in his all these Born series movies that they are just like speed and telling how hectic and fast his life is. So mm. yeah, mm. should we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just mentioned that, like this, um, this setting you were talking about, the fear thing or something. That this, yeah. but this, this kind of a, this as if structure gives me the, gives you or me at least the safety feeling that I'm mm -hmm. safely in my chair watching something like scary, but and it is super scary for me. But same time, I'm in a safe, safe space watching it and. It has this little uh, mixed qualities of feelings and mm. yeah, mixing the virtual and real. Yeah. Do you but think we should now watch this one again or the other one? Uh, I think we have discussed so much, so maybe we can we go can. both of them. We have still 15 minutes. Yeah, we have still 15 minutes. So yeah. uh, next week we'll watch the born one again mm -hmm. because like, we believe that, for example, sound plays a huge role in our the way we access our kinesthetics. So when we in this case when we remove the sound Do you wanna talk or? I don't wanna talk anymore because I realized I don't want to explain it for you whether <laughs> how you will experience but you can show. Me. So, technology plays like a huge role, like in this films or what we are kind of experiencing through this, through virtual or video. And what we've tried to do is often to watch the, all the clips with and without 
music or a song because it's clearly like a very stimulative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what did you? Uh, yeah, it's just an interesting notion for me at least. Uh, watching it without sound, I didn't really think about it as a scene or anything. I was actually thinking about the picture now, and uh, you mentioned. Uh, like uh, someone mentioned the camera action there, and now I was feeling like empathetic towards the person behind the camera because there is a friends like this, and I was imagining them like trying to do the correct kind of camera all the time. There. And it's really interesting, like thinking about their hands. Yeah. The yeah. But you don't care about the car because yeah, yeah. 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 it's yeah. been quite funny to hear the, the breathing of the mountain piker. Yeah, we can try to uh, mixing. Yeah. <laughs> In the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I, I was thinking about it now that like, this is a difficult thing that empathy is supposed to be like voluntary, but then, for example, this editing style like removes the possibility of having any like critical distance or choice because mm -hmm. uh, the images process like progress so fast that you don't actually have time to form like a relationship with them. Yeah. And I was more uh, receiving it as, as a compositional thing, like a flow of forms and different kind of dynamics of things that I was, it was distancing me for, for representation of, of or that there is a car or a person. Yeah. So actually I was feeling now more in, in a sense of the feeling the movement. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, so mm. they are killed this kind of visual <coughs> means to achieve. Yeah. yeah. So what was first? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, and also, as you mentioned, Jan is writing. Yeah. She's mm -hmm. also writing about <laughs> this necessity to develop this capacity of not being moved by the by the images and by mm -hmm. the visual world in, in this urban setting, because that's yeah. something that is constantly done in order to like catch our own attention. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's also one survival strategy: is that you are not moved. By, by this material, which is something that you should be moved, so that it's mm -hmm. like this struggle be between physiology and your mm -hmm. like cognition in a sense, mm -hmm. so that you are like always creating these counter strategies, which are again then countered by something else, and so totally, on. Mm -hmm. totally. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm curious about the physical exercise you did just before we were watching mm -hmm. uh, the movie, so. I, I don't know if you're you're ready for questions or you're, you need to stay. Well, we can we can slide towards that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because I I mean it, because it really makes a difference. Mm. Um, so I got sensitized yeah. by first being in my body and becoming aware of my full sensory apparatus, so to speak. So yeah. Yeah. so the moment you open your up your eyes, you're playing with the light. Of course, I mean there's all these physiological manipulations you do. Mm. to bring me in a state of being receptive to whatever you feed me. Mm. And I thought that this progression of <coughs> uh, input or stimuli was progressing. And I really felt this moment uh, where I was like, this is too much. And I literally feel myself disconnect. Mm. Mm. So I'm curious about I'm a bit, I notice I'm a bit confused about the word empathy. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even sure if I got to an empathetic state, but I am, I was in a receptive state. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not sure if that's the same. So, mm -hmm. so I'm curious whether you're, you, I mean, giving this exercise and making us receptive, um, how did that relates to the work you're doing? Because mm -hmm. we really seem to analyze now the, the pictures we're looking at. But I'm, I'm Notice this moment of not wanting to let more stimuli in because mm. I got sensitized. So it's like that's you know it's too mm. so I'm, I'm just just curious. Mm. Let's see how could I start to answer that. Uh, it's hard. Uh, uh, I, d I might answer a little bit from the side. Mm -hmm. 
that's not a straight, straight question because what we've been actually talking a little bit about because what, what I feel that we are doing is sometimes I feel like uh, we are attacking something that is very important to me. Like for me, like the primary empathy of people sharing a space and feeling empathetic towards each other is super important. And as a dancer, I find it like it would be horrible that if dance would disappear and we could only watch it through a video and or in virtual reality or something. And we are kind of trying to find ways where that could be somehow possible and still work. But uh, it needs, the, of course, the willingness of the spectator to step into the play of, like, uh, the play that we are proposing or the video we are showing that stepping into the play and the breathing is hopefully taking it to closer to your body so you can sense it through kinesthetics as not maybe only as aesthetics or like historical image. Yeah, and in our research we um, we're kind of doing it to this bodily exercises to see what's mm, kind of what's in the video or what there's inside and what it, what it has been eaten or and mm. We have we have created a like method, which we are not talking up so much now. Uh, it's in the very first sta stages, like how to um, form or how to do film or video uh, in a way that it it's um, it's uh, it's being perceived or it's uh, kind of touching the viewer's kinesthetic empathy. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and the uh, method goes like doing some bodily exercises, then uh, incorporating them kind of to the camera techniques or editing techniques, and again into space, and to putting the video into space, and how this uh, from the body to the video into space, how this um, what is the process to get most out of the kinesthetic empathy, mm. kind of. So maybe this is the reason to do body, <coughs> bodily exercises. Mm. I guess yeah. it has to do with uh, who is in control over what and the degree in which you offer me the space to decide how I want to relate yeah. mm. and how close I want to get. I guess it has to do with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. So. Yeah, and um, yeah, we are very much trying to analyze the movement itself. So that's why we are going to the abstract video and like uh, Swap and Tommy were a little bit talking about that, like the movement itself. Mm -hmm. What is the movement we are, to which towards we can feel kinesthetic empathy, like mm -hmm. removing the kind of the cinematic empathy, what Jakob were a little bit referring to, towards some characters or fictional things. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe we could show this. Yeah, I example. want to say one thing while you yeah. look for the video. Like, it's super interesting to realize that like, you are not probably like feeling empathetic towards the ball in the first video that we showed because there's so many balls. So which ball are you feeling empathetic for? But you're feeling like empathetic towards the movement that the balls are doing. And for me, this is the interesting point when you can lose the object and go straight to the pure movement. Now I use pure in a very wide yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, in this one is some. Yeah, let's look something. Abstract. Yeah. This sound. Or not. Rico. Oh, it's oh, small.
Meillä on kolme minuuttia. Yeah, yeah, three minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. there we go. There's, there's a question. Oh, okay. yeah. I, I have maybe a thought. I don't know if this is in any way relevant for your for your project, but uh, of watching this, out, I all, all of a sudden realized that it's also very interesting how we give words to our empathetic experience mm -hmm. that is what we have, and I wonder if this is at some point something that you might want to look at as how 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 we describe that. I feel like there's a sort of a process of translation happening there that's that's also mm. interesting in itself. Uh, mm. Giving you mean giving uh, words for these videos or, or mm. abstract things or, or the experience yeah. of the video or, mm. yeah. or whatever image it, it is that we're looking at. Yeah. Um, because it's um, yeah I, I guess there's a sort of change of systems there yeah. that's happening when you're going from the bodily experience to, to language. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, true. Yeah, uh, there is a translation <laughs> there. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, no easy at all. Yeah, no. um, maybe we are not so much uh, talked or researched or mm. deal, dealing, dealing with this language, well, dealing with the language, of course, and the hardiness of the language, mm. but, but yeah, haven't maybe yeah. thought these things. Yeah, it's a similar problem that happens in dance. You're like, I, I don't know how to describe this feeling that I'm having from this moment, but then it might be similar than I feel in there. Yeah. In the back there, Yes, uh, uh, just came into my mind, if this is a research, like, like now, now I see that there's kind of like a, have, have you, uh, do you have like a, have you become acquainted with the, with the neurolinguistic neuro approach? Because that, that, that's uh, neurolinguistic is uh, NLP or such, which, which is like uh, audio persons or visual or kinesthetic person. That's like a basic, <coughs> basic level. And for me, this is a little bit like a problematic to, to uh, because uh, uh, always when I hear, of course, I'm a sound designer. I always use my ears, yeah. but, mm. uh, but, but to have a, a connection with the video, and uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, the kinesthetic and the empathy part in that one, but if you have the audio, it's a, it's a little bit like a, I'm always I'm, if I'm looking this one, I'm uh, basically I'm listening, and that's something that is mm. there. So uh, like it's just like okay, that's visual material, but but the emotions are coming so straight from from the audio part, and that also in the in the neurolinguistic, that's that's like there is a like a how you feel for something. Mm. So you summarize to her. Yeah. Mm. But if you if, if if you are related to somebody, you start to make that's like kind of like a kinesthetic movement. Also, uh, if you if you are related and you want if you feel empathy for somebody, you start to make the same positions as mm. as as, uh, as the as the person you are talking or something. Okay, you are doing this and mm. the person is doing like that. And yeah. So so I don't know if you have did that. Make, uh, Become a community, or you know about this NLP part? Uh, yeah, well, not so, and uh, I like like this, uh, like what we were really bit, re, uh, little bit showing, like yeah. that, how it's without the sound, and uh, we we really uh, really think that the sound is very profound thing mm. in the mm. also in the visual world. So the visuals need the sound. Okay, so, so this is like audio visual in that case. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. but um, okay. that's maybe the place we have to go in some point mm -hmm. and yeah. when we get the huge grant and everything and, yeah. uh, and uh, we have the time and... Uh, yeah, <laughs> because we believe that the, like the sound has such a huge part so we kind of have, <coughs> we want to leave it a bit <coughs> to the side because it's so easy to bring emotions through sound. Yeah, and I, in my in my like a, in my work with my uh, another colleague, we do this very much sound and uh, video. Like we see, see the first video, uh, last video, our our uh, art and uh, spatial things they are based on that the connection of the sound and video, and I'm like that's my daily process. Just yeah. yeah. just just about to say that if you were to have a really weird piece about dance and film, Moulin Rouge, the tango part, it's supposed to be the, uh, the turning point of the film, mm -hmm. but it's really impossible to uh, relate to. Mm -hmm. 
It's the, the, the tango is cut out of it completely, even though it's a, it's a musical video. That's a funny addition to your list of All right. fantastic yeah. films. Yeah, we have to. I love the movie, though. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's why it's so annoying. But that bit, I think it gives the strength of the tango and the... Like but only, only the suspense, nothing. nothing. Yeah. You can't really tell what they are doing. Yeah. Other than yeah. looking at yeah. their eye. It's Modern nice. editing. Yeah. yeah, it's super edited film. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think that's pretty much it because we're out of time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.